we've already now been through uh, a number of documents and today for the month of, uh, of May, uh, today and a week from today, we will talk about um, one of the short uh, documents and yet one that is very uh, significant in the, in the 20th century and, and going forward. It's entitled Declaration on Religious Freedom. About religious freedom quite freely, all of us. It's something like that we've always had. Well, in point of fact, the history of, uh, of humankind would not easily recognize what we talk about today as religious freedom. You know, people in a certain area, um, for example, with Martin Luther. Martin Luther and what developed into what became known as Lutheranism. Certain parts of Germany, if the, if the civil leader was a Lutheran, then it was desired and enforced that everyone would become a Lutheran. And if you weren't going to be a Lutheran, then you went to a different part of Germany where you then were in the area that the leader was a Catholic. And you would have been a Catholic in the first place. And if you wanted to continue, you went to the second place. Religious freedom is something that does not come into the, the lived experience of people until well into the 1700s, in fact. That oftentimes what we are very used to, we have to first of all realize that this was not what the way it had been from the beginning. It was whoever was the ruler, they were able to enforce a homogeneous set for religion in that area. One of the very first experiences where religious freedom became um, proclaimed and, and solidified in a, in a legal document was here in the United States. Edmund, which says that there is religious freedom and that the government is not to foster one religion over against others, and, uh, you know, and so on. And that, you know, was a gigantic step. The Revolutionary War did get rid of, you know, the British presence and, and all that. Arguably, in a more substantive way, the recognition of religious freedom was a spin-off of the American Revolution and then became enshrined in our, uh, in our government. The thought about religious freedom continues to grow from the late 1700s and then into France. And then more and more it you know, uh, is uh, appreciated by thinkers and all that. And there is some, um, as one might expect, certain countries, this did not go well as an idea. And it sort of comes to a, a major confrontation uh, post World War II. After World War II, we have the establishment of, uh, of the United Nations. And one of the first things that they took on was a declaration, a universal declaration on human rights. The document is still the guiding document for the nations that are part of the United Nations. An American was very, very uh, prominent in that, and her name was Eleanor Roosevelt. There were four uh, diplomats who were chosen and they actually worked on that major uh, document. 
the section in the document on religious freedom in large measure is taken from our own constitution. Now the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church admits it in this document, that the Catholic Church was doing what others were doing. In other words, if there was a Catholic ruler, the people were all Catholic and there was, uh, and there was coercion. You know, and, and we, we've already uh, talked about what happened in 1492 in Spain, which is a, you know, a very uh, strong example that when the Catholic monarchs, Isabel and, and Ferdinand, when they had the, the strength, the power, they enforced that non-Catholics would not be part of Spain. And, 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 and the Jews were told to leave and, um, and they were not you know, belligerents, um, whereas the Muslims, they were driven out of uh, you know, Spain back to North Africa. I mean, so it was a war to get them to leave the Jews, it was done by edict. Some chose to convert to Catholicism. One would, you know, be hard pressed to see that not as a uh, question of coercion. I mean, it certainly was because either that or you were going to be put out. Many did leave to maintain their, um, you know, their uh, freedom of being Jewish and you could no longer be Jewish in, um, you know, in Spain and Portugal. At that same time, in the, uh, in the 1940s and all that time, this now is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. And one of the leading thinkers on this was a man by the name of John Courtney Murray, a Jesuit uh, you know, theologian who wrote extensively on church-state relations and also on religious freedom and also on ecumenism. And some of his uh, books became very, very well known and used by many, many people as very, very solid books. In the early 1950s, his superiors in Rome suggested to him that it might be good if you don't talk about these things now. And he took them very literally. And he, he didn't. And, and so for nine years, he, he taught, he continued to teach, but he taught the course on God not about, you know, he wasn't, you know, uh, teaching God. He was teaching people about God and how God is one and how God is three. And it was all part of a seminary curriculum. The Second Vatican Council, he's invited to Rome to be one of the experts, especially when it came to this document. I just want to pause for a moment. Um, we hear, you know, periodically in the past, Certain people were asked not to write, not to teach, and, and we hear about that in the present. You know, at times, you know, superiors or even the officials in Rome ask. People have opinions on both sides, that there should be freedom of expression, or there needs to be an awareness that maybe what you're teaching, it's uh, too advanced for the present moment. Um, I think that the number of people like John Courtney Murray and others who, who followed what they were uh, invited to do, like John Courtney Murray, others were commanded to do it, like Teilhard de Chardin, and they stopped. Every one of them remained intellectually alert and doing work, and when those um, strictures were lifted, most of them were uh, re, you know, invited into the major conversations and some of them you know, were recognized for their great work. 
It's an interesting uh, side issue about how does one, having made a promise or a vow of obedience as a theologian, how do you respond? And maybe sometime when we have extra moments, we can talk about that, but it is you know, something that there are examples on both sides. The church, there was opposition to talking about religious freedom within the church at that time. Many of the conservatives of the bishops and the cardinals were opposed to it, and yet the, the Holy Father let the, you know, the conversation continue. And it was rooted in that we really need to recognize the dignity of every human person. Now we hear that a lot now, don't we? We hear the dignity of people when it comes to, for example, you know, you know, taking care of other people's lives, the dignity of the human being, and all of that. Well, this was an early example of using that word, that phrase, human dignity, as the foundation that God in his love made each individual person in his image, and he looked for, from them, a free response. If it's not free, then it isn't fully mine. I was forced into it. I was put under fear or whatever. And therefore, it was not a free act of loving God. And so when we talk about human dignity, God is looking for the human being to respond freely, knowingly, generously, not under threat, not under coercion. It was that point that got the church off the, you know, the, uh, you know, the confrontation within the, you know, the different groups, but it was that position as it was articulated, bishops then more and more fell into that influence and were able to accept it and uh, move forward. In no way at all does it say in this document, in fact, it says the exact opposite, in no way does the church uh, play down its role. And for example, in the document it says, we believe that this one true religion subsists in the Catholic and Apostolic Church to which the Lord Jesus committed the duty of spreading it abroad among all men. The church is saying people are free to embrace every, uh, any religion that they wish. However, the Catholic Church is also free to present the message of Jesus Christ. Those two statements are not in contradiction because it'll say later that there can be no coercion or another word, sometimes coercion is uh, you know, portrayed as a physical thing, which in some countries it is, or a fear thing that you intimidate people you know, you won't reap the, you know, the benefits of citizenship if you are no longer belonging to this established religion. But there's also another way, and that is called, you know, when you proselytize someone. You know, you get someone who's vulnerable or weak, not too well, you know, aware of things uh, and, and you take advantage of them. Well, the church says that is not respecting the dignity of every human being. And so the church is very much for maintaining the dignity of each person that their religion uh, and their religious practice needs to be protected because it is the most fundamental 
right as evidence, for example, in our Constitution and the First Amendment. The first right they talk about is the right to religious freedom. Why? Because religious freedom uh, enshrines the relationship between a person and his or her God. So if you, don't, if, you, you know, if you take away the most basic freedom, then all the rest don't matter much either because you have already taken away the most fundamental of those various rights that you have. And so as we reflect on this for maybe another couple of minutes before we have some questions, but then for next week, we will see how the church evolves that teaching being becomes a very strong advocate of the dignity, the human dignity of every person. How do you protect that? One and the most important way is religious freedom, that that is uh, protected, it is safeguarded, that you cannot force someone to go against his or her conscience because then you have used intimidation. Does that resonate at all as you think of the whole issue facing not just the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church in a very significant way, the whole issue about the HHS mandates, about religious employers still have to provide certain uh, procedures, such as contraception and sterilization, and the government is maintaining that they can force you to do that. So, I mean, this um, development in the 1950s and 60s is still very much a part of not just our country, but other countries. How much have they really bought into the consequences of, uh, of religious freedom? You know, here in our country, you know, five, 10 years ago, those kind of things would never have been even considered. It wouldn't have even come to people's, you know, imagination that a Catholic would be forced to, you know, to endorse and to support financially various things that are against their faith. And that was in federal law. That was in federal law going back to the First Amendment regarding religious freedom. And therefore, you know, religious freedom had to be protected and, and you know, and, uh, you know, an accommodation had to be forged whereby uh, people could live in, uh, in integrity with what they believe. Very, very interesting document. It's not very long. It's only like 12 pages. And yet it is something that uh, on next Wednesday, I want to develop the, the individual and the community aspect of what the church uh, developed in that document.